Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. But Isaiah chapter 2, we're going to talk about the next uh, three compound uh, names of the Spirit come from this next uh, uh, couple of verses here in Isaiah. Glory to God. Isaiah chapter 11. Praise be to God. Verse, we'll start verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. Now that's talking about Jesus. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Remember, remember when John the Baptist was baptizing people and Jesus came and uh, John said, you know, and, and, and after he baptized him, the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him in bodily form as of a dove and sat upon him. And they heard a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Remember that? You all do remember that. And then he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, and he was tempted 40 days. And, after, and after having eaten or drank nothing or eaten nothing for 40 days, Satan came to him and tempted him three times. He overcame each temptation with the Word of God and said, It is written, it is written, it is written. And then the Bible says this in Luke, the fourth chapter, says, and he returned in the power of the Spirit. Amen. See, God wants us to get full of the Holy Ghost, and then he wants us to prove it out and walk in the power of the Spirit. Amen. A lot of times we just think, man, you know, I grew up in a church, you know, that people would come and what we call tarry. Uh, for the Holy Ghost, that was our that was a, that was a traditional thing that Pentecostals did, and our Pentecostal denomination wasn't any different. And um, you know, and 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 on one side of the equation, that's a really good thing to wait before the Lord. Uh, but on the other side, you don't have to wait for the Holy Ghost to be sent. Uh, Jesus said, "Go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be due with power from on high." After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But see, the Holy Ghost has come, so you don't have to wait for Him to show up. So we would spend, you know, I knew people who spent years tarrying for the Holy Ghost, waiting on this, come to the altar, be filled with the Spirit, came to the altar to get filled with the Spirit, came to the altar to get filled with the Spirit. We'd slap them, scream at them, bang the piano, tell them to hang on, let go, turn loose. I mean, shout hallelujah, praise, shout praise the Lord, shout glory, glory, glory real fast three times, hallelujah, even trying people doing yabba dabba do, trying to get filled with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> well, a few people every once in a while just slid in and got filled in spite of it, not because of it. Sister Rumley would grab your jaws and they're about to shake your feelings out. I mean, she'd get you right there under the jaws and she'd grab you and just get right in your face. And she'd, she'd try to make your jaws speak in tongues. Now, listen, there was a sweet woman who loved God and prayed and, and knew God, and, you know, but you know, that was just our traditions. The Bible said that the Spirit would be upon Jesus. And then Jesus said that after, after we were going, they, they were going to Jerusalem and the Holy Ghost would come. Well, he came on the day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and filled all the upper room where they, uh, where they were sitting. And cloven tongues of, like a sapphire sat, sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Glory to God. He hasn't left. That was the beginning of the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. So he's come. He hasn't left. So we don't have to wait for him to come from heaven to fill the room. We can just get filled by asking. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I mean, you find out throughout the, after, after that event, from then on in the book of Acts, they would just lay hands on him. They'd get filled with the Spirit. Didn't have to wait right then. Boom. Glory to God. Somebody shout glory to God. Well, when the Spirit of God came on Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, it, it, the, the Bible begins to call the Spirit of God some other names. And so he says here, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that's one name, the spirit of counsel and might, that's another, and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. So three different names compounded in here. So we have, first of all, today, we're going to talk about the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Thank God that the Holy Ghost gives us wisdom. I'm telling you, you can be in the midst of the, of the most difficult thing of your life, and the Holy Spirit can give you wisdom. Now, I remember a number of years ago when we, were, when we first came to Greensboro, and, and I was writing the church general ledger system, and, and I was using a, a language that I had to teach myself because when I was in school learning programming, we didn't have DBase. And, uh, and actually, the, the, the version I was using was DBase 3 Plus, which was a DOS-based language. All right. Now, I learned, I learned the program in Fortran, learned the pro program in, in COBOL, and then my main language at that time was RPG2, 
And that was an RPG-2 program on the System 3s and so forth. And then RPG-2 became RPG-3 on the System 34, 32, 34, and 38. And then they came out with RPG-400 for the, now the many computers that small businesses use called the AS-400. All right? And that's how much it's, it's changed over the years. But, you know, when I started programming for the church, you know, writing the software for it, I was writing in, in D-based, 3-plus, DOS-based. And I remember... Um, what we did, you know, we separate things out according to general account, to building fund, to, you know, uh, taxes and salaries and, you know, like there's nine different accounts where things go, but we use one bank account because that's what Jim Baker got in trouble for. He had 2,000 bank accounts down at PTL. They would just, they would just write checks and float them through the accounts. They would just, so they would, just had a, had, had a, they would just write checks out of this one, float it over here, float it over there, float it over there. And see, so back then you had about 10 days to float a check. And so they just kept those 2,000 accounts floating the money around in circles. <laughs> and, you know, it, you know they just, they, it just never, it just finally fell apart on them. So we just use one account. So, I'm, But the way we do it is, you know, so when we put stuff in, we got these, these codes we created and this kind of stuff. And I remember, you know, when every time we got ready to, to post something in the computer, back then it was the, it was the old 8088s. They were slower than a seven-year itch on a cold winter day. All right? You, you know, you, you would run, you'd run that thing through there, and, and you'd just see it grinding. You could just, just grinding in there, just grinding in there. And, uh, and I thought, Lord, there's got to be a better way to write this, this code. And I was laying in bed one night, and, and, and the Lord spoke to me and says, go do this. And I didn't, I didn't even know how to do that. I didn't even know how that thing worked. I had to go look it up in the book to find out how it worked. He said, do it this way. Use, use, the, use the, uh, the, the macro, and he told me what it was. And I didn't know what it was. I had to go look it up. And when I, went, I thought, it took, it took like 40 lines of code and made it four. And boom, boy, it ran a whole lot faster. Now with the new computers, it just goes blip. Yeah. And you actually don't even get a blip anymore. Yeah. I remember we used to put an error message up if you put something wrong, and I had to put it through a cycle of, a, of, of, a, um, of 10. And it would stay on the screen. Then we got to the, the, the next version, the 286, had to, put it, had to run the cycle three, 100 times so it would stay on the screen long enough to see it. And when we got to the new ones, I had to put it up there a thousand times for it to stay up there about two seconds. You know, run that so you could see the error message. And, um, you know, so that things, things change. But it, it changed everything, and that was wisdom from God. I didn't know how to do it. I had no idea how to use that programming, that, that particular thing in the DBS language because I didn't ever used it. And when he told me, I had to go look it up. See, he didn't, he didn't sit there and go, now you do this and you do that. He said, use this. And then I went and looked it up and read it and went, oh, cool. Whoa. So God will give you wisdom, amen, in, in, in the different times. Now, the word wisdom comes from the Hebrew chakma, and it means wisdom, experience, or shrewdness. It appears 141 times in the Old Testament. And like chakam, most occurrences of the word are in Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. What? Well, those are the books of wisdom. That's where they find it. How to... Dear Lord Jesus. Why in the world is that thing running? Does anybody bring a truckload of tobacco up here this morning? I think somebody's getting ready to climb up the rafters and hang it. Woo! Okay. Um, the occurrence of chakam in Exodus 28.3, And thou shalt speak unto all the wise-hearted, whom I feel with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister in the priest's office. In other words, remember when God uh, was talking and telling them going to how to make the temple, how to make the, the uh, worship things in the temple, and there would be people that he was just going to show them how to do things. They found out by wisdom how to loom six-inch thick material, 40 foot high and 60 foot wide. What's that? The veil of the temple. They found out how to craft gold and brass and how to do different things they didn't know how to do before God supernaturally showed them how to do it thank God God could supernaturally show us how to do things he can give you wisdom when there you just you're at the end of your rope you can be where you just can't figure out how to make it work and God says boom there you go you go whoa I mean you might even like might do the pinnacle amen I mean get all excited praise God because somebody else say amen Hallelujah. And so um, the, uh, the, um, the first occurrence in the Hebrew Bible bears us out as well as the description of the workers of the tabernacle. The artisan was considered to be endowed with special abilities given to him by God. He filled him with the spirit of wisdom, 
of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, Exodus 35, 31. Um, it is the ability to make right choices at the opportune time. How many of you ever needed to make the right choice at the right time? God's wisdom will have you do that. God's wisdom will empower you to make the right choice at the right time or opportune time. See, how many, how many have ever had this thing, man, I wish I had done such and such at such and such time? Or I wish I knew now what I knew then. I mean, now, then what I know now. Man, if I had known this, then I would have made this choice. See, we got to learn to start, stop depending on what, what we know and what we have and trust the wisdom of God. I know that it's good to study. I know it's good to know things. But I am telling you, there are just things in life you're going to need the wisdom of God. You need to be able to just tap into God and find out from God how to do something or when to do something, have the right answer at the right time and be ready for it, and you just don't know it. Bobblehead me. Come on. God will speak to you, and God, by his Spirit, will impart wisdom in the hour that you need the wisdom praise God if you will learn to trust him if you will learn to lean to him if you'll learn to let him speak to you in most cases if you just learn to listen because he talks amen he talks to us I just don't know what to do that's fine it is fine for you just not to know what to do it is not fine to shut the door on the one who does. <laughs> Amen? Because he can speak to you. Remember that old song, I go to the garden alone, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Well, God would come down and talk with Adam in the cool of the day. Not because Adam was so smart was going to give him information. The wisdom and the knowledge Adam had came out of God. Say it came out of God. And like we said before, Adam was not created a caveman. He didn't go muggle, muggle, woman. Adam wouldn't walk around, you know, Adam in the garden wouldn't walk, walk around going, mm, me man, me woman, mm, ba, mm, ba. Adam was created in the class of God. He fellowship with God. His wisdom and intelligence, we shared this every Wednesday on our Thursday night Bible studies, man progressively died spiritually instantly. His soul became progressively perverted. In the beginning, his mind was created with great wisdom. Well, how did mankind do stuff way back? How did some of these things happen in history that we, that we just are finding out how to do it? Because man was created initially in the class with God. His mind was like on the plane of God because it came from God. So a man was able to do things at that stage that, you know, we think, well, had to be aliens. It wasn't aliens. I said it wasn't aliens unless you count God as the alien. And he can't be an alien if, it's, if, he, if he created the planet. It's his, so he's not an alien to it. Amen? Adam was created with a great mind. It became, it became, spirit, it became uh, unrenewed, as we say, or it became renewed to Satan's way after the fall. So in, in coming into Satan's way of thinking, it progressively became perverted into uh, an edu uneducation, into lack of knowledge, lack of wisdom, because it got separated from the, the one who's full of wisdom and counsel and might and, and valor, God. See, we got, we got these images from TV where, you know, man walked around like mugga mugga. Umba, umba. Or, you know, what, what, when, when 10 million years B.C. or 10,000 years B.C. where they, they don't even talk, they just grunt the whole movie Adam and Eve had a conversation with the devil they talked with God they didn't grunt are you here now what's happened that same spirit that had the counsel and the wisdom that Adam had in the beginning that, that failed, that same spirit now comes through the Holy Ghost into us and counsel and wisdom. Wisdom comes from God. To know how to do things. There are things you don't know how to do. God can show you how to do them. Amen. I've had God show me things time and time and time again on how to do stuff that I just did not know how to do. And the hour I needed to be able to do it and, and show me how to figure out how, how to do stuff. That I, sometimes I didn't want to do them. You know, you wanted, you wanted somebody else to do it. You, you might know what I'm talking about. 
You can think, man, I wish somebody else would do this. <laughs> I sure don't want to do it. Hallelujah. But God has wisdom for you. And I know we sat there. And listen, I know people in here, and, and, and even myself, there have been times you didn't tap into that wisdom. You tried to figure it out for yourself and got frustrated. I mean, everybody got frustrated doing your own wisdom thing. I mean, you just like walk up and beat your head on the wall. Thinking, I, I can't get it. I can't figure it out. Bang, 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 bang. That don't help do anything but give you a knot on your forehead. It doesn't fix it. When all the while, down on the inside of you, the Holy Ghost is abiding there. The Holy Ghost, the one with the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. To show you how to do things. To show you things that you can't figure out for yourself. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Then the knowledge and the ability to make the right choice. Don't start saying every time I make this, you know, every time I make a choice, it's the wrong one. Stop saying that. Stop speaking against what God has put in you. The Holy Spirit in you empowers you to make the right decision at the right opportunity. And I don't mean run out to the, 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 the state lottery and go, Holy Ghost, show me what one to do. Amen. Some folks, but I, if, I, if I win, I'm going to tithe. You better more than tithe. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, notice along with wisdom is understanding. Now, in many passages, this means to the, it's the object of knowledge in the sense of what one desires to know. Um, but here, uh, it's, it's, the, it's God's law, therefore, is wisdom and understanding what one should know. In other words, God gives you understanding of, his, of him, of his ways, of his will, of his word. You don't have to, and, and how many of you have ever heard this? You never know what the Lord's going to do. Yeah, I do. Because if it's not written in here, he'll show me. And I'll have, listen, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing, another thing to know what to do with it. Now, now, Sandy has a body shop, and I've seen those guys, and they're putting, you know, the, 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 the um, you know, after they pull it out, used to, you just put, you just drilled holes in it and just filled it with Bondo. You know, you one side of the car weighed 50 pounds more than the other side when they got done. You know, just, just drill, pack it, smooth it. Now, now they snatch it back out, and they beat it down, and they get it close, and then they, then they use, I guess y'all still use filler, don't you? Not much, sometimes. Okay. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. That, that's still kind of like almost like sheetrock guys. You've got to get it right. You've got to sand it out and, and grind it out and get it all nice and smooth so that it's a slick finish. You know? Um, you know, if you don't know how to do things, God can show you. Amen. I did not know how to do sheetrock. God showed me over the years how to do sheetrock, and I've learned the feel for it. I can actually do it pretty, pretty good, you know, pretty, pretty ding-dong dong good. Amen. It's a feel. But in that, you know, I, I, I almost feel like I could go over to her shop and God showed me how to do body work. I'm not sure I want to do it. I don't want to buy all the tools. I don't want to have to. <laughs> but God could show me how to how, show you or me or whoever, you know, how to do body work. Now, I know a lot, a lot of stuff, if it's bad enough, they just rip the side thing off and put a new one on. That's, that's they paint it. There you go. Quicker, easier, and it weighs the same as the other side. I had a, my first car was a four sixty four Ford Falcon, and I'm telling you, if it had been hit, we'd have lost half the car in the road because it had been wrecked on one side, and, the, and the, the bondo was so. I mean, my uncle had bondoed the daylights out of it. You know, now it looked good when you got done, but you know, you could tell that car <laughs> rode crooked. But are the things you don't know how to do in life? Now, listen, this this could be an, an, an application of doing natural jobs or natural things, but I'm telling you, what God really wants to do is lead you in spiritual things so that you're aware of the Holy Ghost, you're aware of the things of the Spirit, and so that you're following after the Spirit, and you have understanding, and see, not just the wisdom of it, of what to do, but how to do it. Now, I can tell you, now most of y'all here, no, we make our Down East barbecue in the, in the fall. And I can tell you, we cook the pork, we chop it up, we add certain ingredients to it, and there it is. Now, I can tell you what to do, but the how to do it becomes the understanding. Amen? Because you've got to cook it until, you know, until the, the, the fat liquefies, and get, you get that, and then you pull the meat apart in your hand, chop it, and you add vinegar and salt, 
and crushed red pepper, the right mixture. I mean, you know, and mix it up real good. And, you know, and, and then you go, ma, 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 ma. Anyway, cook it and mix three things is the wisdom. That's, that's what to do. The understanding is doing it. And God will give you wisdom on things, but then you have to have understanding. You got to go do it. He'll show you not only what to do, he'll show you how to do. And then you react to that with the thing of doing it. And it's amazing. Once you've done something, it changes your perception on stuff. Amen? Because the wisdom came. I remember uh, we had a 1992 um, Dodge. <laughs> Dodge. I keep getting, every time I, I drive a Dodge over to Winston-Salem, I hear something about it. <laughs> when you go get rid of them, them Chrysler products. And, um, but I remember we had a Dodge Grand Caravan, and the starter went out. Well, I called the dealership, you know, and it was $450 or whatever to replace the starter, you know. And um, so I went and found me a book and found wisdom on how to do it. But then I went and got an understanding and went and did it. And that took me, because, you know, where it was located, it was in a weird little place. And what took me longer than anything was finding a, a bolt, a, a, a socket in Greensboro that fit that thing. It was a special size, you could own, and you had to go get some tool company that had a used one. I had to go back, get the one little used socket back then, but this is 92, to get on that thing. It was, three, it was three bolts in it. So once I got, you know, it took, it took an hour and a half at most once I started on it. Now, I would never even think twice about changing that start on that vehicle. See, I've had wisdom. I've had understanding. I've applied it. Now I can do it. Amen? You know, my son's Jeep. If you got a Jeep, 2000. One 2004 Jeep Grand Cherokee and your blend doors broke, come see me. I've had the wisdom and now I have had the understanding. I've actually done it. I've applied that wisdom and actual process. And man, it took me two hours to do the first one. I probably do the first one, 40, the next one in 45 minutes. And it worked like a charm. Nathan now has heat. He's so happy. Called him for the first three weeks after that. Every time I got called, I said, how's the heat, buddy? He said, thank you. He's just riding down the road with heat. Praise the Lord. There's nothing like heat in the winter. Amen? Now, what you don't want is fixed and stuck in heat in the summer. All right? At least you can roll the windows down then. But see, in life, in spiritual things, there is wisdom that comes from God, and then God gives you the understanding how to apply it. Oh, my. How wonderful it is to apply the things of God, the wisdom of God, into, into natural things, into spiritual things of life. You know, of Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. See, that revelation is, is really the understanding. Oh, my, when you, when you have the wisdom and then you have the revelation or the understanding of, of the how-to. This is why God wants us to walk in revelation and wisdom and understanding of who we are in Christ. We can tell you you're a new creature. You know, I, I'm saying I'm born again. If some people don't even know what that means. They walk around saying, I, I, I'm, saying I'm not going to hell. And they think all it means is I'm not going. More is more to it than not going to hell. As a matter of fact, that is just the, that's just the front end of it. Everything else of that is it's totally about nothing to do with not going to hell. It's about walking in righteousness. It's about walking on that whole new plane with God altogether. It's about walking in the realm of the Spirit. It's about walking in the power of God. It's about walking with Jesus, praise God. It's about walking like God walks, hallelujah. It's about be, like being filled with God all the time. Amen. Somebody shout glory. See, he wants us to feel the, wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and understanding or the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So that comes into this, this New Testament mindset that not only God wants you to know about what you have. He wants you to be able to apply it. What good is the new creation realities if we're not applying them to life? What good does it mean that I'm a new creature in Christ if I'm not applying that to how I live on a daily basis? What good does it do us to say, I'm born again, the life of God's in me, and then we're not applying that to every day life living, glory to God, where well, we can apply that new creation reality, that new creation power, that new creation life to how we live every day. It's no good if we don't do that. So the spirit of wisdom and understanding is working in us. Say, he's working in me. Oh, thank God the Holy Ghost came to abide in us. Are you glad he came to abide in you? Amen. And then the next one is the spirit of counsel and might. Now, the word uh, uh, might here means victory, valor, and strength. I'm glad he came to put might in us. He did not call weenie Christians. 
Hello? He didn't call you to be a wimp. You're not a wimp to con. Say, I'm not a wimp to con. Oh, no, 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 no. You're a man or woman of power. Amen? Um, his, his work in, the, in this is to uh, impart to us or give us counsel and strength in all our plans to carry them out. So not only does he give you wisdom and understanding, he'll counsel you. Now, here's what you need to do over here. This is how you need to handle this circumstance. That's not just wisdom. This is counsel. Now, here's this circumstance coming up, and here's what you need to do to deal with it. Because some of us want to deal with it with a knee-jerk reaction right out of our flesh. Yeah, okay, two. Got, anybody, can I get another witness? Can I get three? Can I get four? Can I get five? Can I get six, seven, seven, eight, nine? Can I, can I get the whole congregation? Amen. Hallelujah. Man, we want sometimes just to want to deal with it right out of your flesh. And if we could just, I mean, and, and listen, and we get frustrated because we can't get it done with the flesh. You're not what, I got an answer for you. You're never going to get it done with the flesh. And this is where we got to trust the spirit of counsel and might. We got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, here's a circumstance of life. And, I, and, and the things are going on, and I know you have counsel on what to do. <laughs> now, sometimes, everybody say this, say sometimes. We don't want to hear how to do it. Because I, I remember one pastor uh, down in Eastern Carolina, some guy in the church was hitting up on his wife. In the church. And his wife came and said, look, so-and-so in the church is hitting up on me. And he said, okay. So he went to the prayer. He said, Lord, so-and-so is hitting up on my wife. Now, I just want you to know this. I know you said in your word that vengeance belongs to the Lord, but I got this one. I got this one. You know, you don't, have to, you don't even have to bother with it. I got it. Well, that's, not, see, that's, that's taking care of it in the flesh. There are things in life we're going, to, we're going to encounter, and we need the counsel of the Lord. Why? Because you taking care of it in the flesh is going to make it worse. You taking care of it in the flesh is going to mess it up. Whereas if you'll back up and let the, Lord, let the counsel of the Lord direct you and tell you how to do it, he'll, he'll make it work. Amen. Now, how many know that when Gideon showed up with 30,000 soldiers, he probably thought he had it figured out? Amen. And the Lord says, take them all down to the river. Let them drink. And those who just jump in and just laugh it like a dog, you know, uh, he said, no, you don't even need them. You know, so they had to reach in there. You know, one's reaching in with a hand and drank like this. They drank. He ends up with 300. Goes from 30,000 to 3,000, then to 300. Now, some of us would go, Lord, you messed that one up. That's a big army out there. I got 30,000, and we're going to take care of this. But you see, God knows how to take care of it without your 30,000. And there are, there are ways to do things in life that the counsel of the Lord will not make sense. Let me give you another Old Testament example. Now, how many remember, how many remember Jehoshaphat? When Jehoshaphat was king of Jerusalem a long, long time ago, you know, the enemy came at him, surrounded him, you know, and, they, and they, they called out and they all came up before the Lord, before the temple, and they said, hey, Lord, <laughs> we're in big trouble. What do we do? He says, we're well, not going to need to fight in this battle. As a matter of fact, get all the worship team out there. Get the dancing girls. Get the banner wavers. Put them all out in front of the army. Hello? Now, usually when you go to battle, you don't bring out the dance team on the front line. Okay? They're in the back. But the Lord said, put them out. And you said, said, send them out and let them say, the Lord is good, his mercy endureth forever. And so they got to singing, for the Lord is good, his mercy endureth forever and ever. Yes, the Lord is good. What, how's that go? Forever and ever, praise ye the Lord. His mercy endures forever and ever. Praise ye the Lord on high. His mercy will never end. So they went out singing, praise ye the Lord. The mercy of the Lord will endure forever. Now, I got to think, if we were to fight Russia tomorrow or China, and we sent out the praise team, you know, they're, they're going to be thinking, you know, in the natural, you got to be thinking, they're going to be thinking, these people are crazy. We got weapons. We've got nuclear weapons. We got tanks. We got this. But you see, they sent that praise team out, and the Lord sent ambushments against them, and they started killing themselves. Now, had they done it their way and went to battle, they would have been slaughtered because they were surrounded. 
But because the counsel of the Lord was sent out the praise team, when the army finally got to where they were, they was just picked up the goods and went home. They didn't, have to, they didn't have to kill anybody. They killed themselves. Are you here? See, the counsel of the Lord is going to operate in realms where it doesn't make sense to you. Now, you know, I got, I got, we got some business people in here, several business people in here. And, and, you know, you come up with a business plan. You know, you, you sit down, you draw up a business plan. And that's okay to have a business plan. But you better make sure you're always submitting your plans to the Lord because he might tell you something that that business plan does not make sense to do. Do what? You want me to, huh? But I got the business. I paid money to get this business plan. I pulled in smart people. Let me say, pastors, do not just settle because somebody has a church growth seminar on how to grow your church. Amen. I, mean, I, I know all the plans. I've heard, I've heard so many of them that, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to, you know, you got to look, you, you got to get dreadlocks and got to get, you know, gauges in your ear. You got to get tatted up. You got to get nose bolts in your nose and all this kind of stuff so you can relate. <laughs> Lord, you can just move that way a little bit. Okay. <laughs> That's all fine and dandy. But if the Lord has counsel to do something the way the Lord wants you to do it, you got to do it the way the Lord wants you to do it. You can't do it just because someone else, it worked for someone else, it was the right plan. I know churches all across the world have tried to follow Paul Young. He chose, you know, cell group plan. And the only place that it's worked like it worked in there is there. It's never worked on the magnitude that it did in Korea, in South Korea. Never, anywhere else. People have had some moderate success with it. Some churches have had some decent success with it. But none have had the success that he had with it. Because they tried to copy what God gave him counsel to do. And just because God gave him counsel to do it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And the same thing is in business plans. You might, have a, you might try to copy somebody else's business plan and it just flopped for you. Why? Because you needed counsel from God because he wanted to do it different. There's a different way to do it. You're going to follow God. There's counsel that comes out of heaven. Say, there's counsel that comes out of heaven. See, the Spirit of God will counsel you. Did you know the Spirit of God will counsel you? That went over big. And then he's a spirit of counsel and might. Not only will he tell you how to do it, he'll empower you and undergird and sustain you while you're doing it. Amen? Hallelujah. He gives us counsel. Let's look over in uh, Romans 8, 14 real quick. Now, some of you folks, I invite y'all, if y'all are over in Winston area on Thursday night, come over and join us. We'd love to see you over there. If you're going to go out of town, go somewhere on Sunday morning, come over to Winston on the way out. Come to church over there and then head up to the mountains. <laughs> We'd love to have you over there. That way you don't have to miss church. You get, you get to both. You get to get out early, but you get to get out, you know, you're already on that side of the mountains. If you're going to the mountains, you're already on that side of town. And those coming from Winston can just ride through here and stop in and go to church and <laughs> head out. Beach. That's a beach. Beach. Any beach. Going to the beach. We're going to the beach for Wednesday. Stop here and go to church. Then go. Romans 8 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. See, counsel comes in being led by the Spirit. God wants to lead and guide you. God wants to, wants to, God is not trying to destroy you. Now, some, you know, some people think just because they see something they don't like or they don't like, don't like the way things are going somewhere, they, don't, they think people are doing, you know, the, Things aren't, aren't happening. That God's abandoned. God doesn't abandon his people. I don't believe God's abandoned me or anybody else. Amen. Why? Because I love the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. Amen. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to, you know, find a, uh, you know, to hurt people. So I don't believe God's abandoned me. Sometimes you think it does. You think it does. I'll tell you, there's times, you know, did you know that Jesus woke up one day and got up and said this? He said, except you drink my, uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And the whole crew left except the 12 disciples. All of them got up and walked out. He looked at them and said, you going to leave too? And Peter said, that we, you, you're the only one who's got the words of counsel and wisdom we need. So we're singing around. Praise God they did. They ran it back up to 500 or so at least. That's how many were in the upper room. 
know, until they, they'd run it off after a few days. About 40 days, they couldn't take it anymore. They went home and got something to eat, got, went and got a bath. Man, I hate to think I had to go get some deodorant and miss the baptism of the Holy Ghost without pouring initially. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise God. Maybe everybody else is happy. Maybe that's why I came, because they got, they got smelling better. I don't know. But God has counsel for you. If you're led by the Spirit, you're the Son of God. Amen. Hallelujah. And Acts 1.8, remember this, you shall receive power or dunamis, miracle working power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Amen. Acts 8.29, I'm going to give you a couple of verses. We're going to go home after that. Praise God. You guys came out early, and let me tell you something. You're going to beat everybody to the restaurant because most people are home. Acts 8.29. Now let's back up. Verse 26, now let me, let me tell you, verse 26, and the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the, um, go toward the south unto the way great goeth down by Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Think about this now. What had Philip been doing? Anybody know? Philip had been in the middle of a citywide revival. If you go back at the beginning of this chapter, it says, Then Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to people giving heed to him, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And they brought, they brought stretchers and they brought crutches. They brought all the stuff up and piled it up and all their, you know, their works. You know, because the main, well, back, back up in verse 5, went some, the, the people gave, uh, the, for unclean spirits, verse 7, crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. Many that were taken with palsies and were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in the city. This man's got a citywide revival going on. And then it says, um, now when, now, when the apostles, verse 14, at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them, they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now that tells me one thing, and one thing very, 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 very clear, that if you're born again, you don't, you're not necessarily filled with the Holy Ghost. How could they be filled with the Holy Ghost and him not yet be given, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? They are born again. But Peter and John are coming down, they were going to lay hands on them to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So receiving the baptism or the gift of the Holy Spirit is not the same as getting born again. This verse alone proves that out. They're, they're, they're believed on Jesus. They've been water baptized in the name of Jesus. They're saved. They're going to heaven. They sent Peter and John to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's where we pick up down here in verse 26. So, you know, they're getting filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, and Simon the sorcerer and all that stuff goes on. And the angel speaks to Philip and says, Arise, go to the south into the way of goeth down to Jerusalem from Gaza, which is desert. He's in the middle of a citywide revival, and the Spirit of God counsels him to leave it. Now, I've heard preachers say, say things like this. I don't go to churches for less than 5,000 people because I've got to maximize my ministry. i got Bible that goes against that. Peter, Philip is maximizing his ministry, isn't he? No. You know how you maximize your ministry? Obey God. If you're doing what God said do, the way God said do it, where God said do it, how God said do it, you've maximized your ministry if it's three people. It doesn't matter if it's 3,000, 300, three. If you're doing what God said, how God said, where God said, you are maximizing your ministry. Numbers is not an indicator that you've maximized your ministry. If that were so, the Mormon church and the church of Jesus Christ, I mean, the, the, the Mormon church and the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses would be maximized ministries. They have huge congregations, especially the Mormon church. You know, they got big temples. I've seen gimmick preachers have huge, huge crowds and, and, and so forth. That doesn't mean they're maximizing their ministry. You can't go by that. Well, how, go on. I want you to prove that to me. Well, look what he does next. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and was come to Jerusalem for to worship, was sitting, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go join near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, that's Isaiah, and said, Understand this what thou readest. <laughs> Thank God for the spirit of understanding. And he said, how can I accept that some man guide me? And the, he desired Philip that he would come and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a slant, uh, sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb of, uh, dumb before a shearer, so he opened out his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch said, Philip, uh, answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet, of himself or some other man? 
And then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture to preach Jesus. And they went their way and came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water what doth hinder me to be baptized. And Philip said, If thou believe with all your heart that thou mayest, uh, thou mayest, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. They both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. And that was Scotty up in the, star, in, in the Starship Enterprise. That the eunuch saw him no more. And he went away rejoicing, but Peter was, uh, Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. He was found 30 miles away. Now let's stop here. God takes Philip by counsel of the Spirit out of a citywide miracle revival. How many preachers do you know would pack it all in and go out and go somewhere out in the boonies and get one guy? Think about it. He sent him out into the boonies out of a miracle, out of citywide miracle revival to get one guy saved. And because of his obedience, he got the first uh, translated uh, translation job on the earth. He came up out of the water. Can you imagine the eunuch? Yeah. Woo! Glory to God! Where'd he go? <laughs> And Philip's probably thinking, he's standing in the middle of the city dripping wet. I was just baptizing somebody, man. You see, counsel, God's counsel will lead you to do things that make absolutely no sense. But they're the right thing to do. And because of his obedience, he gets to, go, he gets to get translocated. I mean, that's just cool. That's before Scotty showed up on the Enterprise. Amen? And they probably didn't have that sound going on and the little sparklies going on where you, you, you know, you fade out and, re, you know, you re, re, put all your protons and stuff back together, pro, you know. He's standing there baptizing some guy after he, think about this, a citywide miracle revival. People getting saved everywhere. Everybody's getting saved. People are getting healed. They sent Peter and John down there because Philip doesn't have a ministry to get him filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he could have probably individually, but they sent them. They had, the apostles, uh, Peter and John, had in the ministry to lay hands on people to get them filled with the Holy Ghost. That, that there, is, there are ministries along those lines. I have that operate in me uh, often. I remember one time we had, we, had, we had some people in church. We were, had a service, and I just came up and said, if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, come up. I had about 10 people come up. And one of them was a visitor of, of, of a member of the church, and they, she came up. And, I'm, and I just stood there and I looked at him and I said, now listen, God's anointed me. I lay hands on people, get them filled with the Holy Ghost. They get filled with the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to lay hands on you and say, be filled. You'll begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit give you utterance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And this woman was an African-American woman who went white. I mean, all the color drained out of her body. I mean, shh. I'm thinking, what in the world did I say that just took all the color out of that woman? So I'm going down the line, laying hands on them. I'm laying hands on them. They're getting filled with the Holy Ghost immediately. Let me just lay hands on them. Someone speaking in tongues before I can even get my hand on them. I get down to this woman, and you talk about freak out. You know, I mean, whatever that song is, ah, freak out, or whatever, you know. She has freaked out. And I go to lay hands on her, and she's dodging my hand. I mean, she's acting, I'm like, what in the world? Well, come to find out, you know, she, and she got out of that line as fast as she could get away from me. The, the, the member of the church told me, she said, she found out and talked to her that she went to a church that the pastor told them, if anybody ever tells you they can lay hands on you to get you filled with the Holy Ghost, they're of the devil. Could you please give me scripture for that? I got scripture that the apostles lay hands on them and got them filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? You know, this just because you don't have something that means somebody does is of the devil. Amen. She of the devil. She thought, this man's of the devil. He's going to put something on me. Oh, my God, I'm going to get a demon. Well, the other, the other nine got filled with the Holy Ghost. Change your life. Yeah. Yeah. I said it changed your life. Glory to God. See, we, we need to look at the Bible and find out. Find me the scripture that says if somebody lays hands on you and tells you they got to get to lay hands on you and get filled with the Holy Ghost, that they're of the devil. Remember Ananias. Well, that was just the apostle. Well, remember Ananias was just a man, a, 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 a man who, who, who worshipped the Lord. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't, he wasn't a preacher. He was just, he was just a, a, a disciple. 
And um, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Ananias, he said, here I am, my Lord. He said, I need for you to go to, one, uh, to, to find one Paul, of Tars, a Saul of Tarsus, and, 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 and tell him where he was. He said, behold, he prayeth. And, and he said, now, Lord, I've heard many things about this man, how he, how he seeks people out and so forth. He says, you go your way. He's a chosen vessel of mine. He says, so go lay hands on him that he might receive his sight. That's what he says. And then when he gets to Paul, he says this. He said, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee the way has sent me that I lay my, lay my hands on you that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, he's just, he's just a layperson. He's just a disciple. But we find out that the laying on of hands of the Holy Ghost can be given. Amen. And so he laid hands on him. Now, the Bible doesn't say Paul spoke with tongues. Yeah, but Paul writes later in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you, all of you put together. When did he get filled and start speaking? Everybody, the same way everybody else did. If it ever tells you what happened, they all spoke with tongues. There's only two cases where it doesn't say they spoke with tongues. One is inferred. That's Paul, you know, well, Paul got filled, and then we know that from later on. He said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you, all of you put together. That's that's. That's four that say it. And then when Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ, remember that Peter and John were sitting and they laid hands on them and Simon the sorcerer came and said, whoever, he offered them money saying, whoever, uh, give me this power also that whosoever I lay my hands, that might be for the Holy Spirit. And Peter says, thy money perish with thee for thou hast neither lot nor part in this matter. The word matter is rhema in the Greek, means utterance. He has neither lot nor part in this matter and literally the Greek would say it was a matter of utterance. There was an utterance that took place. There in, in, in where, um, over there in Romans, or Acts, sorry, Acts, when Philip went, Acts 8, where Philip went in and preached Christ. Thou hast neither lot nor part in this matter of utterance. What utterance? Well, if, if I lay hands on somebody and say, be filled with the Holy Ghost, they said, thank you, Jesus, you wouldn't be offering money for that. Not if you were a sorcerer and had bewitched the whole town with your sorceries. Something so new, supernatural and so spectacular took place, he said, I got to have that power. The only thing I know in the Bible that, that bears out with the other, other incidents is where they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and it says what happened is they spoke with tongues. Hallelujah. See, when you get filled, you speak. I said, when you get filled, you speak. Hallelujah. Glory to thank God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank God for the well of wisdom. See, in there that council came. Peter, Philip had that council. Philip, I keep saying Peter. Philip had that council come. Leave this citywide revival. Went and got one guy saved. And then got to go 30 miles away on, the, on, on, on a translocation or beam, beam over ride. But the fact of the matter is the council of God said lead the, lead the revival and go get the one saved. Where if we in our natural thinking would say that was crazy. Why would you leave a city? you got to maximize your ministry. That's a, that, I'm going to tell you something. That's, that's pride and arrogance. Because obedience to God is maximization. Amen. I've had tell, people tell me I would leave Greensboro for you if I were you. Why? Well, I mean, you could have bigger crowds somewhere else. And would you like to have bigger? Yeah. But you know what? We haven't left here. We haven't left this region. We haven't left, and, and we're not, and, and just, just, so you know, we're not shutting Greensboro down so we can open Winston. Somebody, somebody kind of said something to me about that. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're doing. I thought we made that really clear. If we were trying to do it, I would have it at the same time and be flip-flopping between the one to see which one got bigger and leave the other. We're not doing that. That's not what this is about. It has nothing to do with shutting one down so we can have another somewhere else. I told you it's about expanding and going more and getting more done, reaching more people, touching more lives. Amen. We're not trying to, de we're not trying to decrease. We're trying to increase. And, and the Lord told me to do it anyway. Amen. Well, how do you know the Lord told you to do it? I'm sitting at home. Minding my own business. See, this is counsel from heaven. And, and I just got up and went to Janie and said, Janie, this is counsel from heaven. She's got to follow counsel from heaven. I said, I'm going to go call Sandy and see if she wants to start a Bible study in her shop on Thursday nights. She looked at me and said, well, that sounds okay to me. So I pick up the phone. You know, I say, hey, Sandy, what you doing? And she's, you know, whatever she was doing, which is pretty much always the same thing. You know, somebody's in there, you know, bringing a part, getting a check. Now the car's coming in. You got, you know, it's, just, it's a constant thing. Carrying on conversation is interesting. Well, it is. Is it, Donnie? Yeah, yeah. So I said, Sandy. Uh, yeah, what are you doing? Uh, 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 what do you think about this? I think, and what do you think about doing a Bible study at your shop? Start sometime in January. And, and she kind of went, yeah, yeah. That's, I said, 
And then, and like I said, I tell you, I like to turn around like, who said that? I said, the next words were out of my mouth was, and then, then sometime first of February, we'll start a church. That's just going to start a Bible study. So we're going to do, we'll start a Bible study. And then they came out and said, we'll start a church in the month. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> God told me, see, I, I didn't dream that up. I didn't come up with that. That wasn't my plan. Hello? I mean, in the natural, who wants to ride all over the place and, you know, back and forth and, you know, run, run from one church to another? In the natural, but in the spirit, when you're obeying God, you want to do what God wants because you want to help people. So I don't mind doing it at all. I'm just saying, but in the natural, you kind of go, who wants to get up earlier in the morning and drive over to Wednesday, then, then hop in the car and boogie back over to Greensboro and be ready to preach in Greensboro? Because I'm obeying God, I got all kinds of energy for it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Before at 7 o'clock in the morning on Sundays, I was like, I got another 50 minutes. Now at 6.50, I'm like, whoa, glory to God, let's go. We've got to preach twice. <laughs> See, when you start obeying God, something happens. What? The spirit of counsel and might. There's a strength that comes from heaven to empower you to do what God wants you to do. Now, let me say this again. Winston is not about deducting and making smaller and just moving. It's about expanding and reaching more and helping more people and touching more lives. And we're touching lives over there. We're having good Bible studies in the past couple weeks, you know, uh, on Wednesday, Thursdays because of this weather, we haven't had to have our Bible study. Um, we're going to have it back this week, glory to God. Looking forward to it. Because we're, we're, already, we're already developing relationships and getting people ministered to. This, see, council said do this. And see, I, I, you know, if I had two churches of 300 people that we ran back and forth between, that'd be, what's the difference between that and one of 600? Except maybe the, the 300 in Greensboro would never get past that because you can't, there's people from Winston aren't going to come. Or if you were in Winston, the people from Greensboro wouldn't come. So we're going to follow counsel and do something that, that's that not normal. It's not the normal method. And we're doing this. And I'm able, I can pastor both places and, I, and, and stay right here in the, in the area and not have to try to, you know, turn from one church over to somebody else, I can stay right here and do both. That was counsel. I said, that was counsel. And because of the circumstance and, and Sandy's graciousness, it's not costing the church anything to expand. We're able to do this without having to spend any money. Now, eventually it's going to grow to the point we're going to have to get out of her shop and get a place and do all kinds of stuff. I, mean, I, I understand that. I'm cool with that. But right now, we don't have to. We're not having to do anything. Matter of fact, now, you guys need to hop up to the plate. I got embroidered shirts over there. They say FBC Winston Salem. I want to FBC Greensboro. That prayer clause have our logo on it. Amen. Hallelujah. So anyway, I'm saying all that to say this. See, counsel came. Now some people had somebody get to say, well, I, you know, you know, kind of came and said, well, if you start, if you move the church over there, we're not coming. I'm like, where did you get that from? We never said we were moving the church over there. They, they, somebody just dreamed it up and thought it, or they, they're moving over there. We're not moving over there. God told me to do what we're doing. So what are you going to do? I'm going to do what God said to do. I'm going to do what God said to do. That's just the counsel of God. The counsel of God said do it this way, then that's how I'm going to do it. Amen? And I'm not looking for permission from anybody. Paul said when the Lord spoke to him, he did not confer with flesh and blood. When the Lord tells me to do something, I just do it. Now, sometimes, you know, some things you need to share, but he told, this happened so fast, I didn't have time to pull it. Say, look, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. You know, da 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 we're, Here's what we're doing. No, we're doing it because God said do it, and it's, it was on the move. Then we did tell you before we had the first service, but we, you know, praise God. We had to kind of settle some things down, make sure everything was moving in the right direction. But God said do something. See, when you get counsel from God, you've got to do what God said do. And then he'll give you the strength to carry it out. Glory to God. So just, just to settle any thinking, anybody, I, I, and any rumor that may have gone on, because you know, I, I heard it, so I thought, well, it's been, somebody's talked about it. It's, it's not, that's not what's going on. Just so you know, that's not what's going on. Don't jump ship. Oh, they're moving to Winston anyway. I'll go find I ain't moving to Winston. We're starting, we're going to have two, we're going to have two worship halls. Greensboro and Winston. They're not going to be at the same time. They're not on the same days. They're not at the same time. Well, Sunday morning's the same day, but it's not at the same time. Things are designed so we can do and reach more. And I think everybody in this church ought to be jumping up down and shouting and running in glory. We're reaching more people. 
Because that's, isn't that part of our vision? Remember our vision? Reach to start churches in other city, states, and, and countries? We're, that's part of our vision, is to reach out and touch more. Amen? That's counsel from God. Because you know what? I ain't smart enough to come up with that one. Hello? I said, I'm not smart enough to come up with that one. As a matter of fact, the plan I was, at, was implementing was for me to go get another job uh, somewhere and just keep enough money coming in so we could keep doing what we're supposed to do. I didn't come up with that one on my own. But God came up with that one. Amen. So I just want you to know that. That was a, that was a spirit. I, I hadn't planned on talking about this, but they've gotten this counsel. I try to share things in real life experiences instead of just abstractly. You know, if you're not a geometry major, you don't like abstract. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.